Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals to state senators to mayors to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. Today, we head to Grand Rapids, Michigan to speak with Mayor Rosalind Bliss. Grand Rapids is the second largest city in Michigan, and Bliss is the first woman mayor in its history. We talk about her path from social work to elected office, the big challenges of addressing racial equity, affordable housing, and a transforming economy. She makes a great pitch to visit her city to enjoy craft beer, live music, and a beautiful river. Being mayor is the best, but also the toughest job in American politics. I think Mayor Bliss does the job well, and she shares a lot of her well-earned wisdom in this episode. Enjoy. Grand Rapids Mayor Rosalind Bliss, welcome to An Honorable Profession. It is wonderful to be speaking with you today. Uh, It's good to be joining you. Thank you. You are mayor of the second largest city in Michigan, an economic powerhouse in different forms and fashions over the centuries. Can you tell me a little bit about how things are going in Grand Rapids right now and what you're working on? Yeah, thank you. So for individuals who aren't familiar with our amazing city, Grand Rapids, we are here on the west side of the wonderful state of Michigan. We're about 30 minutes from Lake Michigan, and we are the second largest city in the state of Michigan. So we have a population of about 200,000 people. We're pretty densely populated. So we're about a 44 square mile city. And I always say we are the bright light in the state of Michigan. So lots going on here in our city. Our population is growing. We are attracting a lot of new companies and talent to not just the city of Grand Rapids, but really to our entire West Michigan region. And as you can imagine, with that talent attraction and growth comes some additional challenges that we're facing here. But overall, a lot of wonderful things happening. Economically, our numbers, our projections are strong. We have some exciting public projects that we're working on right now. We're working on redeveloping our river and our riverfront. So it's exciting both on the private side and on the public side. Did you see an influx as a result of COVID and people being able to work from different parts of the country? And how has your city responded to that? Yeah, you know, surprisingly, I I wouldn't have said this at the beginning of the pandemic. As you can imagine, all of us were in crisis mode trying to figure out how we were going to get through a lot of unpredictable aspects of the pandemic. Uh, But you're right. What we found is that with the ability to work remotely, that a lot of people chose to come to cities our size. I mean, we're a mid-sized city. We have access to a lot of natural features and parks and green space and trails. And as I said, Lake Michigan. And so we had a lot of people who live in larger cities from Denver to California, Austin, Chicago, either come back because they had family here or come to work remotely from a city our size. And a number of those individuals have decided to stay. So if you look at our data and our migration trends, 30 years ago, you would have seen people leaving Grand Rapids and going to Chicago. And now that trend is reversed. People are moving from Chicago, either back to Grand Rapids or to Grand Rapids for the first time. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about these expected and unexpected changes in economies that shift in your city. And I thought when I was researching Grand Rapids, and I saw that it was the furniture capital of the United States. And then more recently, it's been declared the craft brewing capital of the United States. So that's a symbolic and important shift. And how do you think about the future economy and how your city can prepare and compete for those opportunities? Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting question because very often when I think about the fact that we are, our roots are very deep in the furniture kind of design field. And we 
have been known and are still known by by quite a few as Furniture City. We still have our home to Steelcase Hayworth, Herman Miller, which is now Miller Knoll, and the furniture and design aspects of our history are still really quite rich in our community today. And I see a lot of, you know, the evolution to being known as a, as a craft beer, beer city, which happened about a decade ago, maybe 12 years ago, I saw it as kind of this continuation or building on the entrepreneurial spirit that has been around dating all the way back to Furniture City when we had entrepreneurs starting, starting furniture factories here. And it's been I would say a positive thing for our city in a number of ways. One, we have just this incredible ecosystem of craft brewers and entrepreneurs. Having so many craft breweries has attracted a lot of young talent who enjoy those spaces and that product. It also has spun off into a lot of, I'd say, residual entrepreneurship aspects of drinks, including distilleries. And we have some cideries that are fabulous. And now as we look at today, and I would say over the next 10 years, we're starting to really make some headway and build traction in the field of technology. And so we have this emphasis on technology. And again, as you think about technology, there's a lot of entrepreneurs. We have a very strong entrepreneurial spirit in our, here in our city. Also, this aspect of design and creativity, I think that runs through you know, from craft beer dating all the way to back, back to Furniture City. So I really see it as this evolution of just being a great place for people to try new things and create connections with other industries. And that helps them be successful. Yeah. I think people often get focused on a particular industry, but they forget that it's the underlying skills and culture and you know mindset that creates an ecosystem for entrepreneurship that can be applied in so many areas once it's tapped into. And so the more you can cultivate that sort of mindset, the better it is across your whole economy. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So we jumped right in about shifting economic trends, but you're a social worker by training. So can we talk a little bit about how you found yourself drawn to public service and to eventually becoming the first woman to serve as mayor of Grand Rapids? Yeah, well, I can tell you 20, 25 years ago, I never, ever pictured myself in public office. So it wasn't something I grew up thinking I wanted to do, even in college, it was the farthest thing from my mind. (laughs) So you're right. My background is social work. I have a master's degree in social work from Michigan State. And my field of choice was largely child welfare and violence against women. And so I started working in my field after I had my MSW. And in addition to the clinical work I was doing, I started to get active in the community around really mostly just raising awareness about the prevalence of violence against women and violence against children in our community. And so I started serving on a number of community-wide boards and commissions, very specifically focused on domestic violence and child welfare. And it was from that community involvement that I got to know a lot of other people who care deeply about the issues related to violence against women and children. But I also got to know quite a few women who were focused on getting more women elected to office. So this was back in, I'd say, 2003, 2004, 2005. And many of the issues, the kind of systemic issues that I was working to try to change in the field of domestic violence and child welfare, those decisions were being made around tables where there weren't very many women represented. And so it was through this group of women that I got to know that several of them came to me and encouraged me to run for office. And they were very persuasive and talked about the need for more women to be in elected office. At the time, there weren't any women on our county commission, and there was only one woman on our city commission, and she had decided to not run. So it was going to be an open seat. And so I decided to run. I ran for second ward city commissioner back in 05 and 2005. And I was elected, not by much, I should say. It was a competitive race, both competitive primary and general. And then I started serving as a city commissioner, and I absolutely loved it. It felt like an extension of social work. I was just working on different issues, more neighborhood-focused issues. I was able to take on a number of, I'd say, key issues that I care deeply about around parks and pools and playgrounds, and then served for 10 years as commissioner. And then when Mayor Hartwell was finishing up his term. I had served with him for 10 years. He was actually the one that encouraged me to run for mayor. 
I was still working full-time in my field. I was running a nonprofit for, for abused children. So it was hard for me initially to make a decision to run, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought how important it was to continue the work that we had started during my time on the commission. So I ran in 2015 as mayor and, and was really fortunate to be elected and then was reelected in 2019. Can you talk a little bit about the skill sets that apply from social work, where it's very individualized, right, in terms of service to a child or a family in need, to really being a mayor and thinking about overall systems and where that experience is helpful and then where the experience you've had to develop a new set of skills in order to manage your city? Yeah. So, you know, I think there's a a number of skills from my work as social work that has been extremely helpful for me to serve both as commissioner and mayor. So one social work is a, it's a field that is very holistic. And so I tend to have a very holistic approach to most things. And I, I don't, I don't operate. I've never operated in silos. I think also I've been able to see firsthand the impact that the community and the built environment has on individuals and families. And so I brought that experience with me. A lot of what I did in social work was around solving complex problems. That has been helpful. Another aspect of social work, I did clinical work for a number of years and then administrative work as I stepped into a leadership role at a nonprofit. But having done clinical work and learned how to actively listen, to validate, to sit with somebody in times of struggle and grief and loss and pain and suffering, that has been extremely helpful to me in serving. It's also, though, I'd say sometimes it's really hard emotionally, quite frankly, to carry some of that pain and burden and and feel like you really want to do something but your options are limited. You know, we can't solve every problem at a local level. A lot of people think that we can. A lot of people think we have far more influence and power than we do. And sometimes it's hard to sit with somebody knowing that there's really nothing you can do to help solve the problem. I think that's been challenging. You know, and I think too, like when you step into the role of uh, serving as a commissioner or mayor, it's not that you have unilateral power, right? You have to work with others that are a part of your elected body. You need a consensus, you need a majority vote to get anything done. So even when I care deeply about something, sometimes it can be really frustrating when you don't have the support of the elected body to move forward. And then you work in a, you know, whether you like it or not, you work in a system sometimes a very bureaucratic system, but you also are working in a system that is steeped with, I'd say, systemic issues that are really hard to change, especially around, you know, systemic racism, disparities. And so as you try to make changes within a system, it feels like it takes so long to create change. And I think that's very different than running a small nonprofit where you're able to pivot very quickly. Hey there. I want to take a moment to recommend a podcast for those of you who are looking for more hopeful and positive voices around urban change. Our friend Andrea Learned's podcast, Living Change, a quest for climate leadership. Andrea interviews local leaders who are living the change they want to see reflected in their communities. And she goes beyond city leaders to find corporate and media professionals who are also leading the way from CFOs to Emmy Award winners. These conversations highlight how people's personal values integrate into their work. There are some really good stories here, so I hope you give it a listen. Check out Living Change, A Quest for Climate Leadership, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Now, back to our show. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about because it feels like when you're working, you know, on a client based or in a small nonprofit, you'd be very limited. But there's other limiting factors, you know, when you're trying to turn a large entity like city government or an entire community in different directions. Like there's always limits no matter what you're trying to do. But I like the way that you apply the listening skills and the empathy skills as a way to connect and serve your community in this new role. Let's talk about one of that 
the big challenges you've taken on, which is improving racial equity and police and community relationships, that seems like a place where empathetic listening and engaging and looking holistically across your community is really important. It also seems like a very, very challenging issue to solve at the local level. Can you talk a little bit about that experience as you've taken on those issues? Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll first start with the racial disparities. You know, our city, like cities all over this country, we have deep racialized outcomes based on zip code and, you know, where you live within a city, you know, from education to housing to economic opportunity to wages to poverty to investments, public investments in, in those neighborhoods. And so when I was first elected as mayor, I'm incredibly grateful that I was able be a part of a two-year cohort with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. So when I first got elected, I talked a lot about the racial disparities. We had just outlined in very clear statistical findings the deep disparities that existed around racial lines in our city. And so I was, you know, when I got elected, I was very honest. I, I tend to say this a lot if you know me. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I'm committed to doing everything I can to find the answers. And so when I was first elected, I said, I want to be a part of eliminating racial disparities in our city. I don't have the answers. There's no city out there that has done it and done it well, but I'm going to do everything I can to start to address these deep rooted inequities. And so being a part of the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. And having the support of an organization to help me start to see what we needed to do internally, you know, we implemented a racial equity toolkit in our budgeting process. We created an equity office. We brought in trainers to do racial equity training throughout our entire leadership program. I co-chaired a racial equity task force with our former president of our community college, Dr. Pink bringing together community leaders around what can we do collectively to address racial disparities in our city. And so having support from people who are experts in the space was very helpful to me, especially as I kind of laid out a plan internally and within community. So that was very helpful. And, you know, we started looking at economic opportunity, housing, other aspects. And then, as you said, the issues around policing and, you know, the racial disparities that we see in outcomes when it comes to not just policing, but our judicial system continued to be a core issue really for my entire time as mayor. But then, as you said, it was amplified after the tragic death of George Floyd. And then we had an officer involved shooting here in our city last year in 2022. And being the mayor and navigating that really awful, tragic incident in our city, it was probably one of the most difficult things that I've ever done. I'm grateful that I serve with an incredible city manager and a police chief who, you know, really the three of us came together. And then we have a director, Brandon Davis, who is the director of our Office of Public Oversight and Accountability, an office that we only created in 2020 and are still building and growing even to this day. So really the four of us came together and tried to figure out how do we respond to the incident, be present in the community, listen, and then also identify what we need to do differently as we look at making sure that 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 an incident like that doesn't happen again. So it was, it was a lot of long days. It was a lot of sitting with and listening to community, listening to people scream and yell and express their anger. In my opinion, anger that was absolutely appropriate. You know, there were lots of reasons to be angry and being able to sit with that. And then, you know, the grief and the sadness and the pain and the trauma that it brought up in people and people sharing their own lived experiences. It just was, it was a very, very challenging time. And then helping the community feel like, you know, we're in this together and that, you know, if we're going to create a better, more equitable community, we have to be in it together, even during these tough times. It was a lot of learning. You know, I, I can't say that any of us got it right every single day, but I always said I will do my absolute best. And I think our community has made some incredible strides forward despite the tragedy. And there's still a lot of work to do. I, I think that's the challenge of serving, right? Is that it seems like there's always more work to do. Like there's just, 
the challenges are so great and it just takes a lot of hard work and time. Absolutely. What advice would you have for somebody who may be in elected office or maybe aspiring to elected office who, you know, is drawn to it maybe out of a traumatic event in their community? How should they think about and approach the role as an elected official who is dealing with a frustrated, angry, sad community? And also, you're also trying to acknowledge that, but also then make policy changes that are often you know, difficult and controversial. Yeah. You know, what I fundamentally believe is that being your authentic self matters when you're leading and when you're holding any position, especially in elected office or public service. I think sometimes when we are having to face a very difficult situation or incident, sometimes I'd say a natural tendency for some is to be very defensive and to not want to be a part of sitting in the space where hard conversations and difficult things are said. And so, you know, my advice would be is to one, be your authentic self, you know, just be present and be authentic and recognize the humanity in everyone, which requires us to not only give other people grace, but we have to give ourselves grace. And it is hard times create hard experiences to sit through and to be a part of. But I really believe that in order to get to that place where you can think about solutions, you have to process the raw emotions first. It's very difficult for people to be thinking about solutions if they're still feeling really strong emotions. So yeah, to me, it's a process that you really have to embrace and recognize and appreciate. And I think it actually makes you stronger. And and in the end, I think you make better decisions. The other thing is you have to listen to everyone, not just the people that you agree with, not just the people that are the most angry. So I had to meet with and spend time with people who had very strong opinions about different things related to what they believe we needed to do around police reform and improving community police relations. All of them have a right to be heard, even when you don't agree with them. And their insight, again, helps you recognize that there's not one easy answer, that it's far more complex, and that you need a multi-pronged approach to change, right? And you need to bring everybody along. This is everybody's community. And so, you know, even the individuals or the groups in our community who don't necessarily agree with some of our policy decisions, spending time with them, listening to them, and then explaining where you're coming from, in my opinion, is very, very important. And so you have to be prepared to do that. You know, you have to be prepared to spend a lot of time listening and explaining and then talking about what is the best way forward. It strikes me that that was a brilliant description of just how human this endeavor is and also how different that is from essentially every other incentive in our political system today, (laughs) which is to simplify things down to tweets, tap into people's anger and frustration, and then, you know, demonize the opponents. And so how do you, in a world where that seems to be increasingly the norm for elected officials, how do you maintain that commitment to listening and engaging on the most basic human level. Yeah. I have to tell you, it's one of the most frustrating things that I have seen evolve over the last, I'm in my 18th year in public office and the lack of appreciation for different opinions and views is striking to me. And the willingness to demonize somebody because they don't agree with you is just, it's at a level I've never seen before. And the desire to take something that is so complex, and as you said, put it into a tweet or say that here's the solution, it's just not realistic, in my opinion. And so it does take time. I believe it it takes a commitment to building relationships. I really believe that relationships are at the heart of what we do. I think COVID had a significant negative impact on our ability to connect and build relationships. And I think we're still trying to make up for that today. So some of the things that I do, if you look at my calendar, most of my time is spent 
with other people, whether it's individual meetings, small group meetings, round tables. I do a lot of getting out and talking to groups and answering their questions, whether it's, you know, a church group or an organized group or professionals in our community. So a lot of it really is just getting out and connecting with community where they are and having a space where you can provide good information, but then also where you have ample time to answer questions that are on people's minds or, you know, that are weighing on them. I think making sure when you're in a position, whether it's a a mayor or a city commissioner or state rep, or, you know, at any level, you need to take time to connect with people, listen to people and answer their questions. As you mentioned, the job of a mayor is never ending and the challenges continue to grow. And so, you know, as you build a better, more economically, racially vibrant city, that then puts pressure on your housing stock. You just spent your last state of the city talking about plans to improve the affordability of housing. Can you talk about how you're going to try to do that and maybe using some of the same skills that you just outlined in these other policy challenge areas? Oh yeah. Housing. Oh, it's been, it's become, you know, it's so interesting to me. I feel like housing has always been an issue, but it's, I've seen both aspects of of the pendulum in my time here. I, I was on the commission during the economic downturn when we were dealing with foreclosures and vacant buildings and blight. And now we are in a position where we have more people than we have places for them to call home. So we have a huge housing crisis right now across the spectrum from low income to affordable to market rate, far more need than we can meet right now. And so again, thinking about it as a spectrum of housing needs, how do we make sure we have plans to meet the needs wherever you fall on the spectrum? So we have real needs around low income housing, transitional housing, permanent supportive housing for people who are currently in unstable housing or have no housing at all. And then affordable housing for kind of that missing middle or working class. And then we have, we're attracting a lot of individuals from, you know, other places who are selling their homes and coming uh, to Grand Rapids with a lot of money in their pocket who want to buy, you know, a $500,000, $700,000 home. And and we don't have those available either. (laughs) So we're looking at what tools we have. We're looking at vacant property in the city that we can zone and make at right, you know, where you can build multiple units. We're looking at changing some of our policies around accessory dwelling units. We're looking at what can we do around infill to support that. We're using the economic tools that we have, brownfield tax increment financing, neighborhood enterprise zones. And then for low-income housing, we work closely with the state We've been advocating for policies around gap financing, funding for missing middle, and then also just working with the state to open up more tools specifically for affordable housing. So there's a housing TIF package that we've been pretty vocal about supporting at the state level. We're hoping that that will move forward uh, in the next couple months. So it really is looking at what can we do here at the city? How can we work with the county? The city of Grand Rapids, we created an affordable housing fund. So we took some of our ARPA funds and put it in an affordable housing fund. At the county level, they created a revolving fund for affordable housing and seeded it with $17 million, but they're in the process of securing private dollars and setting up a CDFI with those funds. And then, as I said, the state and MISHTA has been very supportive of allocating additional funds for housing. The governor has been a a huge supporter as she talks about housing needs throughout our entire state. So again, it's multi-layered, you know, the city, the county, the state working together to try to come up with a plan to move forward with housing as quickly as possible. We have in the city of Grand Rapids said we have a need of, you know, well over 14,000 units over the next five years. And so we have to accelerate the building side as well. Like cities all over, you know, we have been struggling. You know, our companies that build housing, they are struggling with staffing issues and just being able to meet the demand. So we have needs that we have on the workforce development side as well to get more people into those careers. It really takes a community collaborative response in order to meet the growing need. So I I hesitate to ask our closing question, which is, you know, if I had a weekend to spend in Grand Rapids, how would you recommend it? Because I think 
perhaps people come, they spend a weekend and then they want to buy a house and it adds to you the problems that you're facing. Uh, but if people promise they're just going to come for the weekend, how would you recommend and what would you recommend they do in your city? Oh, that's such a great question. I actually appreciate talking about something fun like that versus some of the other issues that we are trying to tackle here in my office and here at the city. So if you haven't been to Grand Rapids, what I always say is, is Grand Rapids has all the amenities of a big city with a small town feel. So very often, if you come to Grand Rapids, you will feel welcomed. People are very friendly here. But you will, whether you love music, we have incredible options for local music. We bring in a lot of acts, large scale national acts as well. We have ballet, we have opera, we have Broadway. We have an amazing Frederick Meyer Garden sculpture park that is stunning with a huge Japanese garden. You can go and take a peaceful walk and experience just incredible art. But my favorite, I would say, is I love coming downtown and I live about three miles from downtown and I love coming downtown and walking along our river's edge and then getting a beer at one of our craft breweries and then finding local music. So usually the place I go for local music is listening room. It's now called Midtown and I will grab a drink on my way over there and go watch a show or go to a comedy show there. But it's one of my favorite spaces, I should say, right downtown. And it's just a lot of fun. That sounds amazing. And I look forward to checking it out. I did spend a little bit of time. I should spend a weekend in uh, Grand Rapids at the President Ford's Presidential Library there, uh, which was also beautiful. And yeah, you have an amazing city. And we're so proud of your leadership. And we're proud to have you as part of New Deal. And we look forward to watching your efforts unfold in Grand Rapids and hopefully taking those models to other cities. Uh, Thank you so much. It's great to join you. And thanks for highlighting the fact that President Ford is a grand Rapidian and this is his hometown, which we're really proud of. (laughs) My pleasure. Thank you again for joining us and forward to seeing you at the next New Deal conference. Sounds good. Thanks so much. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. Thanks to the team at New Deal for producing this episode. We encourage you to bring honor to public service, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars are used in the making of this podcast.